Hi everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Ah, oh, great. So welcome to the Gaia meeting. Um, this has been a hectic week and we didn't have much time to coordinate with Jane. I see Jane, you are there. So you can jump in at any moment. Yes, hello, thank you. And um, no, carry on Leandro, you're doing a lovely job. I'll take notes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so well, um, we didn't have a meeting in the, la in the previous year, IETF and um, and still we are in this uh, remote mode. Um, I hope you saw the agenda. Um, we we start with the note well um, uh, information that you have in, on screen. Um, I think you you know or you must know. So basically, if you're aware of any RTF contribution covered by patents or patent applications must be disclosed yeah, or participate in discussion and, and several other clauses. Uh, here there are the, this documentation is also in the um, data tracker. Uh, you can find it and, and explore the links. Um, also the code of conduct as a participant that you need to behave in the way described in the slide and basically respect and concordance with the policies expressed in the different RFCs and documents. <clears throat> you know, the goals that we, we are discussing in this meeting about uh, research aspects, not about developing standards, although development of standards could emerge from the work in the IRTF groups and more documentation for for IDF participants and, and Background information is there in RFC 7418. Just to remember, uh, this is the charter of the Gaia group um, that refers to a study on from 2012. So, so it ha it has certain age, and um, and is about the the right of everyone and probably everything to be on the internet. And considering also the digital divide or the inequality as well, that uh, still nowadays uh, about 50% of the population um, do not have a chance to to be part of the internet. It's not not only just a matter of cost, but also a matter of ability to do that. And then. This is a summary of the objectives of the Gaia Working Group about increasing visibility, about creating a shared vision, about articulating collaboration, about documenting and sharing experiences and research results um, on the different ways of, of bringing connectivity. Um, again, document costs, which are because sometimes cost is a barrier, um, and a longer term perspective on, on how this could influence the standardization efforts at the IETF. And then just to go into the current meeting, apart from what I was doing now, uh, this is the draft agenda we shared um, days ago, where we have uh, these, these, let's say, three main topics and, and, um, and the last one. Um, so um, I don't know if you have any comment about the agenda, any, any, any important thing that should be modified. Um, I hope the speakers are here, which is another uh, element that might change the agenda as we go. Any comment on this? Please go ahead and chat or speak up. Well, if not, I think we can move on. And um, I'm not sure if 
Matogoro is, is there. He offered to talk about the role of a community network cooperative in, in addressing the digital divide in Tanzania, but I don't see him connected. So, um, if not, maybe we can move on to the, I don't either see Mark connected yet. I'm not sure if it's connected to that, but I made a mistake in the upload in the agenda where I reduced the agenda from a previous meeting. I changed the date, but I forgot to change that. It was not Tuesday, but Friday. I hope this didn't confuse anyone. So if not, uh, uh, we can go to the third uh, item in the agenda. Um, I prepared some slides about, um, just to open the discussion. Um, at the beginning of the year, we, we had some emails to comment about um, ideas for a 2021 plan so we can organize uh, future meetings based on, on topics of interest. Uh, the charter of the Gaia working group was defined some years ago and, and things have changed slightly or more than slightly in the last year. And um, so that we can prepare and, and prioritize topics for future discussions. So we have time to even have like a, ideally um, topic specific meetings so we can um, collect ideas and, and discuss and then perhaps elaborate some documentation about it. So uh, regarding this, um, these are the slides that I simply, I took the, the ideas and I put them into, into, norm, into slides so we can, we can go through it. So I'm going to introduce them and then I mean, feel free to, to take the floor and, and give your opinion as, we, as I go. I mean, feel free to interrupt me and add anything to what is written there. So, um, yeah, for instance, there was one, this is a link, in fact, uh, there was a call for um, someone to write a report on uh, what ha have been the internet technical success factors and up to now. This was proposed by Besna. Um, so trying to collect what worked, what has worked well and what has worked less well on the technical aspects of the internet. Um, I propose and several people also commented about, you know, when, when we introduced uh, the charter of Gaia, uh, we were thinking about bringing the internet for everyone. But you know this, uh, I don't know if you ever read about uh, sustainability aspects, but uh, there is, for instance, um, uh, one representation called don Donut Economics. I don't know if you know about this Donut diagram that puts together the, um, the bare minimum uh, of uh, the human requirements to, to participate and to ensure that uh, most of human beings uh, have a chance to connect and to participate in the digital world, I mean, related to inequality and the sustainable development goals, that's one aspect. But of course, when we do that, when we expand the internet for everyone, we realize that we end up using materials, energy, um, polluting materials, uh, generating e-waste. So we can we can simply expand the internet for everyone, but we, need, we have to make it in a way that um, we don't destroy the planet as we go. So, um, yeah, I mean, the internet is part of the solution, but also part of the problem. Or if you know, the ITUT has some documentation related to what are the expected impact reduction uh, of uh, the ICT uh, world in general by 2030, which is to be, has to be about um, a reduction of about 42% or something like that. Um, with respect to the numbers in uh, in 2018, I think, if I remember well, I think it's ITUTL 4070 or something. 
1040 or perhaps uh, and and then this is this contradicts the objective of expanding the internet for everyone while we reduce it to half in terms of impact So I'm not sure if, if, if anyone wants to comment or I'm not misunderstanding. Oh, okay. So uh, you, Nils, you are asking uh, in the queue. Uh, Hi. Oh, yeah, go Hi, ahead. This, this is Nils. Is this the, uh, the right moment to talk about these proposals or would you like to do that uh, later in the session? No, I think um, it's a good moment to go and, and comment now because um, we had two other presentations and I didn't see um, the speakers connected. So I think you can we can comment a little bit as we go and because we can then uh, define better what topics are interesting to to each person and um, and then uh, we can choose which ones we can, we want to spend more time. Um, because there is nothing else expected to in the agenda. Thanks so much. So with the rise of 5G, but also other notions of uh, uh, network management, we see an increase of computation happening uh, in the network. And currently in the network management research group, there's also a draft on that. And I was wondering whether this would be the moment to give end users more influence and power over network configurations and in such network configurations users could exemplify what values they think are important and whether they would for instance like to consume low energy or have hmm. a higher privacy requirements such as on a application level as being used through uh, a do not track which hmm. uh, but that would then perhaps allow to do that on a network level. So give users uh, more possibility to express their needs and configurations in a network level and thus uh, uh, leverage the input of users on uh, how networks are run. Yeah. Anyone wants to add to that? My hand up, Leandro. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, this is Jane, for the record. Um, I like what Nils is saying. Um, it might be very interesting to hear more about um, network configuration and um, what other users would like to see for more, uh, I would say, control, but I don't know if that's the right word, Nils. But um, one thing I thought that might be interesting um, for us to talk about is uh, innovative solutions for um, power in some of the networks that we all are seeing, whether they're um, small mobile networks. We've got, we know some 4G networks out there that are considered community networks, but they're also operationally um, uh, sustainable private networks that are using different um, energy source uh, energy sources from solar to wind and other things like that. So it might be interesting to have a discussion about what we're seeing out there as far as that standard. There's a group in Europe that I can't remember the name. Um, but Michael Ogia is involved with them. So we may want to see if we could have a presentation there. And one other topic I would throw out, and I'll remember this for the notes, <laughs> is open data. Um, how we contribute to uh, making sure that there's um, openness so that everyone has um, information. And Steve Song has volunteered to talk about that at the next um, Gaia meeting. So I think this issue of open data may be something to explore. I don't know how and what, but I just wanted to bring it up. Mm -hmm. Bint, do you want to talk? Um, I think you can freely yeah, thank, speak. Thank you very much. I, I had a little trouble uh, getting in this morning. Uh, on a bad URL of some sort. Anyway, uh, Jane makes a good point. Um, two things. First of all, um, there is a term flying around called uh, data trusts, and it, it has to do with collecting of data and providing access control to it. You know, under the right uh, circumstances and conditions. Uh, the purpose being to make sure that the data gets to the right people. Uh, so that's a, a concept that's uh, worth some consideration. Uh, even if the data isn't absolutely 100% public. 
uh, being able to um, manage access in order to enable people who, uh, who need in that information uh, could be quite useful. The other thing on uh, power supplies, uh, just uh, an observation about how important it is to examine each uh, target location and evaluate uh, what its um, conditions are in order to figure out what might work. So for example, if you're up in the north and the, it's going to be dark for six months, solar power may not be your friend. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you're in the equator, uh, you, you probably get a lot of days of sunlight. So uh, one of the things that is super important, I think, is as we all work towards this internet for everyone, uh, is to report back what has worked and why it has worked. Uh, if, or if it didn't work, you know, why it didn't work. So we can figure out how to apply the learnings uh, to the specific situation that we might be trying to um, uh, achieve. Uh, there is a, an organization called the Solar Electric Light Fund. Uh, it's self.org. Uh, and I would uh, recommend, uh, if you're interested in potential solar power, that you have a look at uh, what they've been able to do I was able to uh, to help um, support the installation of solar power generators uh, or electrical uh, uh, converters uh, in order to support uh, some um, uh, American Indian reservation access to the internet thanks to uh, NSRC and uh, um, Matt Rantanen, uh, who runs the uh, Tribal Digital Village. So there are lots of uh, potential uh, ways in which to deliver power and we just need to look carefully at each situation to judge what's possible and affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we've seen like comments about uh, the data, but also about the, um, the opportunities to act, also related to the environmental impact. Um, people can do indirect assessments of the impact, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, transparency to act, to access information about uh, environmental real environmental impact or real power consumption or even uh, maybe more controversial like um, how to combine routing and energy and uh, choices uh, about your traffic or as Neil said choosing uh, m maybe protocols or paths or or options uh, so that we we break the divide between the providers of the network and the users of the network which simply use it but may, they might have a choice beyond that so i see someone with a difficult name to speak to sp spell that uh, go ahead and and i think you can simply talk i'm not sure really sure how the queue works i see that people is in the queue but i, I don't know really So if you're in the queue, I think you can speak and directly. Ignacio, who we know, who's done some work with us on some things. I just wanted to throw that out. Ignacio, is that you? I am. Could you hear me? I can. Okay. I think you can uh, need to, to enable anyone. You can simply directly talk. OK. No, just to say that the energy consumption and the heat uh, production about the perhaps some components of actual internet like data centers, it's it's a problem. Uh, here, uh, okay, we, we have to to take this 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 problem as we can do it, but uh, I, I think this is a very huge problem that is more large than this specific uh, group. This is one thing. The second thing that I would like to say is that perhaps we can articulate with another uh, another uh, uh, societies like IEEE. For instance, we are trying to set up a proposal for community networks in Latin America. And perhaps uh, this could be a, a good opportunity to, to go and to to find another another society like internet society uh, to to get uh, this uh, this problem to 
to develop more quickly this kind of uh, uh, community networks. Many sense. Yeah, one comment to what you said. Uh, Idropoli um, used to have, I was in at least in one meeting related to the humanitarian initiative, and um, there is people there that is uh, sensitive to this topic. So, yeah, it's possible to collaborate with uh, in that respect. It's uh, it's Vin again. If it's all right, if I jump in one more time. Feel free, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I was, it occurred to me that uh, there was one other technology that uh, had popped up on my radar recently, um, and it's free space optics. Uh, one of the problems that you run into uh, when you're trying to bring a significant uh, internet capacity to rural parts of the world uh, is that pulling fiber is sometimes pretty expensive, uh, both uh, from the capital point of view and also from the point of view of load. So uh, there's been some uh, serious work on uh, the development of lower cost free space optics. Uh, and uh, there's at least uh, one group at Google, the uh, X, well, it's at, at Alphabet. Uh, the X, X group has been uh, working on uh, driving cost out of uh, free space lasers. In this case, uh, the particular implementation uh, provides somewhere between 10 and 20 gigabits a second on a single laser link, uh, the, the pair of lasers uh, in small quantities is, is $50,000. In larger quantities, let's say over 100, uh, is more like $25,000. So even though those are still significant sums, compared to the cost of pulling fiber uh, for data rates in the 10 to 20 gigabits range, uh, that's actually not too bad. So uh, that's another technology that is worthy of, of attention. Doesn't work in all cases. You clearly need a, a free uh, you know, point to point shot. Uh, it doesn't go through hills and foliage very well. Uh, but for places where um, the atmosphere is not overly burdened with rain, for example, or other uh, inclement weather, uh, and, uh, and, and you have a, a direct uh, point to point shot, it can be a, a terrific alternative. Uh, for providing a high-speed middle-mile link. Yeah, sounds a good, an excellent option to complement the, the alternatives. Uh, but uh, maybe one one controversial topic would be that you, when people talk about neutrality, uh, mm, can we think about uh, environmental neutrality? Can we? Uh, as Neil said before, can we choose a path that uh, consumes the less energy? Can we avoid data centers that uh, have um, high inefficient uh, operation, uh, or it's simply a choice of the network? Can we change protocols or analyze the protocols in terms of environmental impact? I no, see someone. It's, uh, it's, it's Vin again. Uh, there is someone uh, with a, um, a name that looks like it's written in uh, Sanskrit uh, who would like to speak. Uh, the, but I, since I don't speak Sanskrit, I don't know how to say the, his name. His name. Yeah, he said just a, a minute ago that uh, he he was having a problem, then and he will get back. I so, see. Uh, All right. Well, let, yeah. can I respond to the data center question for a moment? Uh, okay. Is as you may know, Google operates a number of data centers around the world, and they are large, and they consume a lot of electricity, uh, sometimes in the you know hundreds of megawatts. Uh, on the other hand, one of the things that we have focused uh, on in the past decade is to uh, acquire energy uh, through green means. And so we have, uh, at this point, I believe, um, uh, acquired um, virtually all of our energy uh, needs for the next 20 or 30 years from green supplies. Uh, and uh, so I would argue that uh, driving uh, power requirements out is, is in our interest and everyone else's as well. But if it's possible to generate the energy uh, using renewables, uh, does that uh, change the equation uh, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. It's uh, really great that Google is now buying up a lot of green energy. Unfortunately, with that, they're also buying up all the green energy that was actually meant for housing. And with the overall increase in energy consumption, it's still overall a net negative. 
So we should probably also do something about reducing the consumption of energy uh, 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 and step on the idea of continuous growth and continuous increase in energy. Or Google could perhaps also start running its own energy uh, provision. That would also be excellent. So just uh, to uh, pick, uh, pick up on that, if it's all right, uh, the analysis here in the U.S. Uh, might vary in other parts of the world is that the energy consumption is split about one third, one third, one third, residential uh, business sector and manufacturing. Um, and uh, the um, in introduction of things like uh, LEDs has certainly uh, driven uh, some energy requirements out uh, significantly. So in California, for example, the energy use per capita has been flat, despite the fact the population is growing and of course more residences and more businesses. So uh, I think we can look to and encourage uh, further development along those lines where we can produce the same result with a lot less energy. Uh, and that I think will help uh, balance the equation. We have uh one participant in the queue with a name that I don't even knew that it was Sanskrit. Can you can you try to speak and send your point? Hi, my name is Sachin. So the name came about because it asked me for a Unicode name, and that's how it came out. Can you hear me, please? Just wanted yes. to check. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So Wint was right. It's actually in Hindi. It's Sachin Garg. So that's why my name is. Uh, I have this question about when we are talking about the. Uh, various things like power and all these things. One of the very specific things is the protocol level things. We have seen that, I have seen during my time in the industry that everybody is actually moved to HTTP and basically protocols that are more data hungry, I would say. Well, we use pure uh, text and things like that. So is there a way to basically to go back to, is there any sort of a thinking of going back to protocols that we used to have in the early 80s or 90s where you had a specific file transfer protocol or a specific protocol, some sort of a protocol designed for specific applications rather than putting everything into a sort of on the HTTP and or everything being on top of HTTP and HTTP being the only protocol that works. So this is just a thought. I, I don't know. Really. So uh, it's uh, it's Vin again. Um, this is a really interesting question. I'm going to give a weird answer to it uh, because uh, one of the uh, problems we run into in the interplanetary extension of the internet is our inability to do uh, kind of uh, you know high uh, interactive protocols. You know the, the sort of thing where you have lots of exchanges back and forth, which we do commonly uh, uh, here in our terrestrial internet because the latencies are fairly low on the whole. Uh, on the other hand, when you're talking about uh, you know transmission to and from Earth and Mars, we're talking 40 minute round trip times in the worst case. So the protocols that have been developed for that uh, tend to be very um, uh, well, non-interactive, let me put it that way. And so um, perhaps uh, there's something to be said for that. I will say, however, that this only works if you have an application that doesn't require very much interaction at all. So the uh, difference between doing this video conference where we clearly are interacting and transmitting at, uh, at high speeds and at rapid pace, uh, you'd end up more like uh, email exchanges with attached videos, uh, which are not interactive particularly. So you'd have to look for applications that don't require this interaction uh, to have protocols that can be bundled up uh, in uh, relatively infrequent and uh, high latency fashion. Uh, so I don't know how many, you know, protocols will, or how many applications would be suitable for that, but that's one dimension to think about. So you are proposing to put email servers uh, out of Earth? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that, that no, actually, uh, what I would argue here is that you simply have to start thinking in emailish terms, where hmm. you send something and then you don't know when you're going to get a response back. And there, for some protocols, that's okay. For search, would be really frustrating, I think, as you type in something and you have might wait for hours before you get an answer back. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can move on. And also, by the way, um, we can discuss about the problem, but we also can uh, propose uh, ways to work on it. Uh, we are a research group, so we can do research, and we can even think about what uh, the outcomes could be. So maybe we can, I don't know, 
we can come back, but we can move on maybe to the next topic about the public versus private internet policies that respect human rights. I think that um, someone said about that, um, and or IXPs uh, as one particular type of infrastructures. Well, uh, was, Leandro, was, it's been, uh, oh, Jean, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Leandro, what was the other infrastructure you noted other than ISPs? I caught the ISP part. Sorry? You had noted different types of infrastructure that we could take a look at, like IXPs and something else. I didn't catch the other thing that you noted. Oh, no, yeah, IXPs, yes. Okay, and I think that may have been where Vesna was going. I liked her idea, too, but Bint, over to you. Uh, well, uh, this, of course, is a topic of great interest to me, um, partly because I've seen policies uh, adopted where um, the private sector, for example, attempts to prevent communities from building their own pieces of Internet. We've had experiences here in the U.S. with legislation that's been promoted by uh, some companies to pre prevent a community, for example, from building its own network. Now, having said that, I will say that there have been a number of instances where people have tried to build their own networks and it has not worked out. The maintenance and sustainability have, have, uh, have not worked. In other cases, it has. And so, again, I want to reiterate how important it is to examine why did things work or why did things not work uh, as we try to uh, find ways of encouraging all kinds of uh, implementation to satisfy people's uh, access to the Internet. Um, so I'm of the opinion that um, that um, we need to adopt uh, policies that will encourage a variety of different means of, of uh, implementing these things, including the possibility of um, uh, public funding, which we're seeing here in the U.S. Uh, just recently with the passage of a very big uh, uh, Recovery Act uh, bill that includes quite a bit of money for uh, underwriting the cost of expanding uh, internet access, especially in rural parts of the country. Uh, so uh, my strong view here is that, uh, that we want to uh, see both private sector encouragement to invest and public sector uh, willingness to underwrite uh, in places where uh, the, uh, the service might not be uh, fully viable on its own. Uh, on the IXP side, again, it's super important, especially if a number of different networks uh, could be interconnected for efficiency. Some of you will remember back in time that um, countries in Europe were interconnecting through United States facilities, and so their traffic was, well, the term was tromboning back and forth across the Atlantic. There was a considerable effort to build internet exchange points in Europe to allow local interconnection. A similar um, motivation comes from the uh, construction of content distribution networks, uh, which uh, locate uh, content of interest close to uh, uh, the networks that the users are connected to, uh, to avoid the need for transmitting the data repeatedly uh, over long distances. And so I think there are an, a number of tactic, tactics that uh, increase the efficiency of, um, of uh, information delivery and access and we should encourage all of those wherever we can in order to make things more affordable and frankly more efficient mm -hmm. in fact also in europe there are some uh, talks about uh, policy initiatives to to help in in respect to what the role of the internet has been during the pandemic that uh, there is interest in public investment uh, to expand uh, coverage and to reduce uh, the population that couldn't really participate because there was nothing in the middle to allow uh, any kind of connectivity. And in fact, I'm connected now at this moment through uh, the Giffinet Community Network. This is my home connection, a fiber part of that community. So you see that it works. And in, in, one, in parts of the network, we found that um, sometimes public sector didn't really invest in the network in the long term, but simply reduce the risk by deploying um, some critical uh, backbone links, and then those links being repaid uh, as the network grew, grew so that uh, in the end, the public sector simply reduced the risk, but didn't really waste or lost any money and even sometimes got the money with some interest.
So you've just described an interesting uh, phenomenon that occurred in the United States in a different context. In 1934, there was something called the Rural Electrification Act, and its intent was to provide power, uh, electrical power, to parts of the United States that were not, you know, not in the urban environment. And so uh, the low-cost loans were made to uh, private sector entities in order to allow them to invest in the equipment needed and the distribution facilities needed. And uh, at the same time, that same act also supported um, infrastructure for telephone service. So both telephony and electricity were uh, uh, provided uh, through that um, mechanism. So that was low cost uh, loans effectively and low interest loans. And so that's another kind of mechanism that can be used to enable uh, construction where it might otherwise not be possible. Yes, yeah, so I think one useful outcome of the research is to show uh, viable models that uh, reduce the risk or to facilitate the expansion of of infrastructures and, and enable even, I mean, private citizens or small companies to do something that would not be possible without the initial support of the governments and. Um, and have a kind of a, the, the, as a result the the rapid expansion of uh, coverage um, and also all this discussion is connected also to the environmental impact how do we do that efficiently so that it also is energy efficient or it helps the expansion also of power networks as well not ju just data networks I think the following topic, maintenance of a public internet commons and public interest is, is well connected to this. I think Mallory was commenting about this in, in the mailing list. So uh, it's Vin again. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm uh, taking more time than is my fair share. So uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, tell me if I should uh, shut up. Uh, but I did want to respond to the uh, public internet commons idea. Uh, we're seeing, uh, in the U.S. anyway, uh, more instances of public internet availability, whether it's uh, in the coffee shops or in the libraries or in uh, schools and things like that, where the general public also is, is given access. But at the same time, there's a lot of uh, concern over privacy. Uh, and I would draw attention to uh, the IETF's work uh, in this area for um, opportunistic encryption, for example, for Wi-Fi access, uh, and uh, techniques for um, protecting um, strong authentication or using strong authentication to protect identity uh, for, uh, for people who are trying to use public facilities to log into their, um, their uh, services. And so a very important um, Part of all this, I think, is making sure that the general public using these open facilities is uh, adequately protected um, with regard to privacy and safety and security. Uh, and that seems to be an important mandate for IETF to look at protocols that will achieve those objectives. At the same time, I think privacy and security are very important, but I think if we talk about a common or a public internet, we shouldn't stop there. Because it's actually quite surprising that it's still impossible, largely, to have a email address in a non-Latin script, which means that the majority of the people on this planet cannot have a email address in their own language. And the internationalization largely has, uh, uh, has not worked on the application level, let alone on the protocol level, which means that if we really want to produce a global network, we need to kind of decenter the Latin language, but also the English, te English text that is now so common in teaching and maintaining protocols as it is, this, as it is at this current meeting. So yes, privacy and security are essential, but we also need to do a power analysis and go further towards social and economic rights that we want to take uh, into account and have a truly global uh, internet. John, you want to talk? Yeah, the, uh, uh, just to correct one thing, the inability to use uh, 
non Latin script in uh, email addresses would be a uh, a surprise both to the people in the IATF who uh, who did the protocol work for that and did several millions of people who are using such addresses every day. Uh, there are some serious problems with non Latin email addresses, but they're not the technology. They're uh, there are a whole series of human interface issues associated with what happens when you try to use those addresses uh, outside your own community. And, uh, and while the analogy is not complete, uh, our, the problems that several of us on, uh, on this call reading uh, Hindi in Devangari script is, uh, is symptomatic of one of those problems with email addresses. But, uh, but it's not the inability to have those addresses in a technological standpoint that's been available now for several years, and there are, again, several millions of people in uh, uh, in a number of countries, including China and India, who are using them every day. Thanks. When well, this is probably connected to the uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, put a point to what was just said about human interfaces so it has been a terrible thing to be able to type in indian languages on a com typical computer keyboard and it is a problem that still persists so the way i actually entered the form was basically by typing it on my phone because that's the only place where the soft keyboard works so the real challenges are actually about interfaces and the ability to be able to type stuff into uh, thing though, though technology is still there a problem I've tried to get hold of some sort of an international domain name system but I was never able to get the hang of how IDNs actually really work so I mean I, I'll have to relook that but these are the real problems that how do you type in characters of domain names and things like that on systems that are there so this is a, a sort of a separate problem which is really not an ITF problem it's more of a other challenge problem and that's what we're calling as the next part of the digital divide where access people may have i'm in india and we've got wonderful access lots of people have wonderful access to the internet so access is not that much of a problem today rather the problem is the availability of content which is becoming to be the next digital divide thank you for hearing me out yeah thank you for your contribution uh by the way i could see in the chat that uh, People say, Bint, you, you are not uh, preventing anyone to speak, so your views are very welcome. <laughs> and and the last comments about the um, about the non-Latin addresses, in fact, uh, uh, in my place, we speak Catalan, uh, kind of close to French in the alphabet. And uh, and I volunteer in a ISP, and we always have trouble with people that want to use uh, uh, non non ASCII characters in email uh, on the left or on the right of the at symbol, because uh, yeah, even though the standards are there, um, it, it is in the end not that usable, and that's really a pity. Because it's also a barrier. I mean, for global access to the internet for all, that's a barrier. They have connection, but they cannot express themselves freely in their um, in their um, local script. I had more topics to to raise. I, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. I can't stress that I can't stress that too much. <clears throat> um, the uh, the underlying protocol technology for a lot of things is there. Um, uh, identifiers, internationalized identifiers, generally, uh, email, local parts, domain names, and other things. Um, we've got two sets of problems at the user interface level and. Uh, and perhaps that's something this group should be paying more attention to. Uh, one of those problems is local. <clears throat> uh, uh, when, uh, when companies design a system and then think that they can <clears throat> translate that system, either the um, vo keyword vocabulary or the uh, system or, or the page layout or the characters into uh, some other language and script and culture in a relatively crude or automated or uh, artificially uh, stupid way uh, that often doesn't work out well. So there are important issues relative to 
uh, making certain that user interfaces are actually, uh, and the things which access them, keyboards included, are actually culturally reasonable and appropriate for, uh, for a particular locality or language or culture or system. Uh, and, uh, and that requires work that we haven't been good at doing, although there are notable exceptions around the world. The second problem is that when people from one environment using their own language and script and email addresses uh, in that language and script are trying to communicate with uh, people somewhere else using a different set of systems, especially if the languages and scripts are very different, um, uh, we run into a different set of problems. And, uh, and I've said in other contexts that it's perhaps no accident that uh, that the creation myths of uh, of many of the uh, religions of the world have uh, versions of stories about language differences and incompatibilities and people having difficulty communicating with each other that are attributed to divine intervention. And I hope we don't need divine intervention to fix the problems, but we at least need to be aware of them and conscious of them and uh, and incorporate them into our thinking rather than saying this isn't available in that evil. Um, thanks. Thank you. It's uh, it's Vin again. I'm I'm glad that John jumped in because uh, he and I and others spent quite a long time working on internationalized domain names uh, in the 2008 to 2010 period. Uh, I did want to mention something about coping uh, with uh, multiple languages and scripts. Uh, I still I agree with John. We don't do this very well. Uh, in the uh, in the Gmail application, for example, it is possible uh, to enter uh, non uh, Latin scripts as uh, as email addresses. Uh, however, I find myself, uh, for example, corresponding with some of my friends in Japan, struggling um, when I see their um, Japanese uh, script names and not really being uh, comfortable figuring out which of them am I looking at because I don't speak Japanese and I don't read it in particular. So uh, we have um, tried hard to provide translation of content in email. It, it's never perfect, but it, with machine learning, it's getting better and better. So on the content side, uh, it has been possible to provide translations of, uh, of some degree of utility. That does not, however, uh, improve the problem of entering content in a particular script if the keyboards uh, don't support it. And even if you do, uh, if the recipient isn't prepared to deal with that language, um, translation is still needed. Translation of names uh, almost makes no sense at all because they're basically phonetic strings. So, um, so that doesn't work. So there's still a lot, a lot to be done uh, to deal not with single language environments, but rather multi-language environments. And here, I think we could encourage significant research and efforts in the IETF to, uh, to the extent that anybody has some good ideas for tackling what I think is a pretty hard problem. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, especially when problems are involve multiple disciplines, it's not just maybe matter of protocol design, but also cultural and, and linguistic aspects. Shall we move on, perhaps, uh, to, I mean, this is second and last um, mm, list of uh, topics that emerge in the, in the list. Do you want to pick up one and comment? I mean, feel free, anyone, to just select one and, and say something about it. Simply, I took ideas that emerge in the mailing list. Uh, it's been, I'd like to pick on the wholesale access uh, thing. We've had uh, what I think were fairly successful uh, results uh, in Uganda. Google built a, uh, in Kampala, we built a fiber optic network in the city and then made it available at wholesale rates to retail resellers. And that seemed to work okay. In fact, it worked well enough that I think we ended up forming a, uh, a joint venture with uh, other local companies. And then I believe we replicated that in Ghana, although I might have had that might have that wrong. So if somebody needs to correct me, feel free to do that. But I am attracted to that idea uh, that we empower uh, multiple retailers competing with each other to offer uh, uh, value-added services. So that uh, strikes me as being a pretty interesting tactic.
And then maybe the uh, to move on and given the time, uh, this slide is about what things you, do you believe we can do in, in Gaia uh, with the topics that we discussed before uh, to to produce some um, useful outcomes for moving forward in different ways, like uh, choice, uh, write about it, um, report, and so on. Well, it's been again, I have to uh, leave in nine minutes, and maybe that's all the time we have anyway. Mm -hmm. um, let, let me uh, respond by saying that the, the most valuable thing I think many of you could do would be to report on successes and why they worked. What were the conditions that made things work? Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, if it didn't work, please explain why. Um, it, it, to help others formulate plans and avoid uh, traps and mistakes that, uh, that you've already uncovered. And so this is very, very helpful to do uh, anywhere that, uh, that you can cast light on tactics and strategies uh, that produce the desired outcome, which is getting everybody online in an affordable, sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Nils? I think to I that really end, uh, whoops, go ahead, Nils. I really hope people will also report failures and obstacles they found along the way of uh, changing power imbalances because that will then allow us to see what the obstacles are and see how they could change either by technology or uh, policies or, uh, or or funding schemes because uh, as we all know and have seen in the discussions before that no problem is mainly, merely technical merely social or merely economic so i'd really like to understand and see more about open hardware open software and governance from below and uh, community organized networks, telecoms, and infrastructures. Jane, you, you wanted to comment anything? Just to agree on the on the the need for more data, um, as Vint and um, Niels are suggesting with respect to, you know, what worked, what didn't and um, what the problems were and what the um, failures and obstacles were so that others can learn from that. There may be, we could put out a call for some case studies. Um, I know a lot of organizations are putting some of those together and they could be tweaked to handle some of the, the points that, that others are making here. Yeah, in fact, um, I, I was part of the, for instance, in the case of APC, they do the GIS watch, and, and a big part of the work is uh, is about supporting uh, different groups all over the world into reporting their experiences with a, an, in, in, a, in a length of about two, three, four pages, and, and that helps a lot. It's been again. Uh, one other thing, this is a, a request. Uh, I chair something called the Marconi Society, and we have been having uh, decadal discussions about hard problems in telecommunications uh, and computing that if they were solved would make a big difference. And so we're looking for sort of like the decadal studies that they do in astrophysics. You know, where should we go look next to get better information about what the universe is all about? So in this case, we're looking for hard technical problems that if they had solutions would make a big difference so we can focus attention and research uh, on that. So if you have ideas uh, for succinctly stated problems whose solutions would make a big difference in the space that we're talking about here, please send them to me, vent at google.com, and I'll make sure that, uh, that we capture those in our uh, Marconi uh, Society report at the, uh, at the end of the year. Thanks so much. Wonderful, thank you. And maybe just to conclude, uh, because we are running out of time, it's, um, you know, I realized that um, we, we had one RFC in, in this um, working group that is uh, dated in August uh, 2016. It will be five years uh, in, in a few months. So we, we discussed some time about that, but maybe it's time to um, think about revisiting what alternative network deployments is and what we have learned along the way for possibility results but also for impossibility results as well what do you think
Uh, hi, it's Vin. I certainly think that would be a, a practical uh, and useful thing to do. So, um, you know, you have my vote. <laughs> Thank you. So, the, Jane, do you want to say any uh, comment anything about before we we are done today? Um, I think this has been a great debate, and um, I'm really. It was really great, and I was very interested in it. So I think what we may need to do, Andrew, is take some of the good points here um, to the list. I like your idea of looking at the charter. I think Vint does too. So why don't we take some of the um, the text that we've got here and look at it and come back to the, the mailing list, because I think the whole case study idea is an interesting call for action. Um, and others uh, have noted that too, and then we could look with the group online at the charter, do some asynchronous um, work together. What do you think? I think it's an excellent proposal and, and a, an excellent way also to finish this uh, meeting with uh, something to do and uh, looking forward to put together the notes of the meeting and, and continue this discussion in the Gaia mailing list. Thank you so much for everyone to join. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye. See you on the net. Yep. That. See you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. You're coming. <laughs> okay, so we'll look at the charter asynchronously, and I think I've captured it all. And I just want to ask I think we still have the Meet, e Meet Echo folks here with us. Um, do I have to do anything to capture the chat, or will it be an automatically captured the notes that I've taken? I think it will. I just want to validate that. Nils or others, do you know if uh, all this will be captured? Yeah, it's automatic. Lovely, John. I thought so. I mean, I was typing it, so I figured it was captured. <laughs> it's, this, this, is the mag this is part of the magic of Meet Echo. <laughs> I love Meet Echo. Okay, wonderful. Well, then, this has been fun. Um, thank you, Leandro, for organizing everything. Thank you, everyone, for participating. So, uh, Leandro, I'll be in touch, and we'll come back to the team here. Thank you so much. And also, thank you for the Meet Echo guys to make this meeting yes. so smooth. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. you to Meet Echo. Lovely. Thanks all. Bye, everyone. Bye.